in my opinion, you can describe much of the, the history of civilization as simply a constant battle between the forces of centralization and decentralization. And uh, what happens spontaneously in any organization, but certainly also in any civilization, is that it by itself becomes more and more centralized. Thirteen point eight billion years ago, the universe burst forth. The universe, without a central power to control it, burst forth and created everything that exists, as far as we know. It was the Big Bang. And that's the first moment we can describe the universe as we know it to be today full of matter and radiation and the ingredients that would eventually grow into stars, galaxies, planets, animals and human beings. We know that the Big Bang was really hot, really dense, so it was a fireball in some sense, and it's been expanding and cooling ever since. The matter cooled and uh, coagulated together to form stars and planets, and here we are. Yes, here we are, in the forever expanding universe that evolves spontaneously and matter is created to fill the voids. As this material accumulates, it forms new stars to replace the old ones. That radiation was tied to matter, it was coupled to matter in the early stages of the universe. And what we see when we look at the pattern of radiation, it's not quite smooth, it's very slightly varying, that slight variation tells us about the state of matter only a few hundred thousand years after the Big Bang. And from that, we can then put together the entire story of how matter flowed into galaxies and stars and planets here today. So it allows us to see the earliest stages of the universe. About 9.3 billion years after the Big Bang, our solar system was created. The center accreted to become the sun and the widely spinning particles turned into large fiery balls of gas and molten liquid that cooled and condensed to take on solid form. About 4.5 billion years ago they began to turn into planets that we know today as Earth, Mars, Venus, Mercury and the outer planets. The Earth was born four and a half billion years ago. It was extremely hot here and, uh, and, and slowly the atmosphere condensed onto the Earth, originated, was made on the Earth's atmosphere, on, on the Earth. And the planets next to us, Mars and Venus, they were formed in a similar way as the Earth and they also got an atmosphere. The evidence is overwhelming that all life on Earth has evolved spontaneously from common ancestors in an unbroken chain since its origin. Yeah, life formally, we can say it originated two and a half, four billion years ago in the very early time of the Earth's evolution. But life as we intuitively connect with life it originated only half a billion years ago. Uh, it's the one that uh, is born at a certain time, live its life and die. And that's very different from the early organisms. They didn't have this cyclus. So we connect life with something that is born and later on die. Nature is endlessly creative and it seems to try almost everything. Over the course of billions of years, it has created an unimaginable quantity of the most intricate and sometimes distinctly odd life forms. 
Approximately 99% of the genetic material of humans and chimpanzees is identical. Two of these odd life forms perhaps marvels. But 1% makes a big difference and we keep speculating about what happened to separate us from the chimps. The creativity of nature can explain most peculiarities, but not all. It seems to me self-evident that the study of human evolution is something that is uniquely of interest to everybody. We're all the outcome of a long, long evolutionary history. And um, the details of that history are, of course, what uh, made us the creatures that we are today. So there's a special uh, fascination, I think, for human beings who are, of course, a very egotistical species. As Charles Darwin explained to us, such marvels could happen extemporaneously through random change combined with natural selection and competition. This sample, he said, can create spontaneous creativity. With Darwin's discovery of natural selection, the origin and adaptations of organisms were brought into the realm of science. That's the process by which those organisms that best fit in an environment survive and get to reproduce, while those that are less fit slowly die off. So those who stand and those who fall. But what happened in the process in which we were separated from the chimps? First, hominins, which include pre-humans, have survived for as long as they have done. The average lifespan of mammal species on Earth has been between three and four million years. But our species is probably five to eight million years old already if we count from the lost ancestor for chimpanzees and humans. 50,000 years ago, our brains underwent a major genetic mutation which resulted in the biological reorganization of the brain. Some scientists call this the Big Brain Bang. After the Big Brain Bang, we have developed our brains very fast. Humans are truly privileged mammals with brains which have developed in a type of extraordinarily fast evolution that is unique to the species. But how could our brains grow so fast? The first critical factor is that pre-humans only lived in Africa, which had a very volatile climate where many areas would alternate between humid jungle and dry savanna. These cycles meant that the populations of pre-humans oscillated between doing pretty well and pretty badly. And when they did badly, they were reduced to small isolated groups. Whenever this happened, there was more inbreeding, which led to accelerated genetic mutation. However, when times improved, populations grew and reconnected, resulting in a battle of genes with the best ones winning. For nearly a million years, our ancestors had settled for blunt stones, but then, about 700,000 years ago, a genius invented the stone axe. And perhaps a half a million years ago, the first tents made of skin were developed. And then came the invention of funerals, knives and rope, domestication of wolves, the needle made of bone, art and clothing, and so on. Evolution without a central power has been working very hard to produce us humans. But life doesn't evolve in a line and it doesn't end with us. But we're always shown evolution portrayed something like this. A monkey and a chimpanzee, some extinct humans all on a forward and steady march to becoming us. But they don't become us any more than we would become them. We're also not the goal of evolution. We may not be the goal of evolution, 
However, those best adapted to their environment are more likely to survive and pass on their genes to the new generation. The human brain's genes had gone through an intense amount of evolution in a short amount of time, a process that far outstripped the evolution of the genes of other animals in the book of nature. The unfinished book with no central power to control what it may contain. An unfinished book, for sure. We're just seeing the last few pages of each chapter. If you look out on the eight million species that we share this planet with, think of them all being four billion years of evolution. They're all the product of that. Think of us all as young leaves on this ancient and gigantic tree of life. All of us connected by invisible branches, not just to each other, but to our extinct relatives and our evolutionary ancestors. So here we are, with already five to eight million years of history, and we have survived because our bodies, and especially our brains, have developed so quickly. Harnessing the latest finding in evolution, biology and archaeology, we can now understand that the great drivers of human progress have been imagination, creativity and cooperation. This film dives deep inside the decentralized structures of human history, which cooperation and indeed creativity have shaped. It is, I think, a core pattern in human psychology that we believe that everything is ruled from the top or everything should be ruled from the top. The first one who really broke ranks with that idea and articulated uh, another idea very well in a book was Adam Smith. So in 1776, he came out with a book, The Wealth of Nations. And there he describes incredibly eloquently how people can self-organize and how that can be really efficient. I feel he is there affirming uh, an ethic of universal benevolence, that we all and always have a responsibility to advance universal benevolence. That's his term, and I like that term. The benevolence is of some kind of being, like we speak of somebody being benevolent, right? And so it's a universal benevolence because it's a sort of universal being who somehow beholds the great scene of humankind. And uh, in a centralized system, you have a central planner who decides what needs to be done. And the problem with that is, with the vision of labor that we've seen developing since Adam Smith, and before that, but he was the first to observe it, uh, the knowledge that individuals have is very deep and very specific. And there's so much knowledge in society, there's no way a central planner can, can understand it all. So you need a de decentralized system for that knowledge to produce the best possible results and all the ideas and innovation that is needed for productivity to grow. And because it's a benevolent being, what it sees as beautiful is prosperity, happiness, long life, multiplication of the species, humankind. So it's, a, it's a, actually an aesthetic idea, uh, but it's, it's one we can understand very well as human beings. Now in the theory of moral sentiment, he affirms that we always have this responsibility to advance universal benevolence. And he doesn't so much go into commerce and industry in that, that's more where the wealth of nations comes in. And I see the wealth of nations as arguing that by pursuing honest income, you in fact do advance universal benevolence. For Smith, the most important outcome of the rise of productivity was what he called the universal opulence, which extends itself to the lowest ranks of the people. Adam Smith sincerely believed that Everybody would profit from the new wealth. The rich, of course, will become richer, 
but the poor will also become richer. Or to quote him, a general plenty diffuses itself through all the different ranks of society. Almost a hundred years later came out the book The Origin of Species and that was by Charles Darwin, it was in 1859 and he described nature in a way people had not seen before. The first edition of On the Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection by Charles Darwin. Darwin phrases a lot of his book as a personal invitation to look at things my way for a little while, see how well it works, see all the difficulties, see how I can explain some of the difficulties. He said nature is actually self-organizing and it evolves over time. This was a, just like, like uh, Adam Smith's book was a revolution. Charles Darwin's book was also a revolution, but they were talking about the same thing. They were talking about self-organizing systems. And the interesting question is, what can we learn from those two books and what can we learn from nature that we can adapt to the way we organize societies? He managed to, through very, very careful observation and just thinking about things, uh, present it in a way that uh, became palatable to people. And uh, although, uh, of course, it's caused a tremendous amount of controversy, that was inevitable. Um, once you go through any kind of major paradigm shift like that, uh, not everybody's going to like it. I mean, people today still don't like it. While organizations are hierarchical networks, spontaneous orders are distinguished by being scale-free networks. Further, organizations can be and often are a part of spontaneous orders, but the reverse is not true. Even further, while organizations are created and controlled by humans, spontaneous orders are created, controlled and controllable by no one. Um. It's how systems of interacting individuals, whether it's people walking down the street, ants in an ant colony, birds in a flock, or the cells in our bodies, um, organize themselves into larger scale structures, not because anybody has planned it, but just because the local interactions between them give rise to food lines of ants, um, patterns of people flowing down the sidewalk. So should we, patterns of humans flowing down the sidewalks, go unconditionally in for decentral groups? Or does a centralized organization still have some benefit? When you're facing an external threat, you want to be able to mobilize resources efficiently and quickly, and you want that process to happen rapidly. Um, if you had to go through many different um, uh, areas of cooperation, uh, discussions, uh, to mobilize and to defend yourself, uh, you may be overcome by an enemy. So the, a state that wants to function as a state needs to have the ability to respond quickly to something that's very significant and pressing. And it has some benefits because when you centralize, you can make very big projects. The Romans built Hadrian's Wall across England. Named in honor of the emperor who ordered it built, Hadrian's Wall was one of Rome's greatest engineering projects. This enormous 73-mile-long wall was built between AD 122 and 128 to separate Romans and Scottish Picts. Today, the remaining sections are testament to the completely centralized Roman Empire's ambition and tenacity. What else did the Romans bring to the island? They influenced the language and culture, they built cities such as London and introduced new agricultural practices. 
Being extraordinary engineers, they constructed well-paved roads, bridges and viaducts, as well as sanitations and plumbing. Above all, they brought order and central organization and created, albeit harshly at times, Britannia. Another example is when in a democracy, because ultimately we're talking about democracies as efficient states, and uh, when in, in a democracy you have a consensus that a certain project needs to be achieved, the decision by the United States to put a man on the moon would not have happened um, had these processes been coordinated by 50 states. Uh, um, a decision was taken that this is what they wanted to do and that's what they achieved. <laughs> In the ideal world, markets are what creates uh, innovation, productivity and growth. But sometimes markets don't work perfectly. So there are things called market failures, pollution is the classical example of that. And that, there is an argument there for centralized uh, interference in the market to correct market failures. The point is, also, when you correct market failures, you, need, you want to be as decentralized as possible. So you want to pick solutions that correct the market failure without putting the market uh, to rest, so to speak. So, for instance, if you look at climate change, you don't want centralized planning deciding which technologies will solve this problem. You want to create an incentive for uh, private companies, for private individuals, for consumers to create the solutions that we um, might not even think about right now, that solutions that we cannot imagine right now, but uh, will be possible with new technology and new ways of doing things. Is this whole global warming problem going to be a lot easier to solve than anybody imagined? What the world needs now is nuclear energy. Um, as very much like we talk about ants or humans self-organizing and thinking about it in terms of how the initial cells, the embryonic stem cells, become the embryo and give rise to the fetus and give rise to the postnatal child um, and then grow as you go through adolescence into an adult body. All of this is at the cellular level is just cells interacting with each other. No cell is thinking, how do I make a human? When everything is dictated from the top, the small units, uh, the small teams, the individual people cannot experiment anymore. So centralization kills creativity. And that is a huge problem in the long term. Uh, so no question that, uh, that, that to have a well-run society, you want to have as many people thinking as, as locally as possible, having responsibility locally, because the other flip side of having responsibility is that you have accountability on the other side, that people actually understand if somebody does well, it's that guy here. It's not somebody you don't even know somewhere up in, in, in space. If you feel that you are just a very, very small part of a very big machinery and you're not really deciding anything, everything is being decided uh, for you by some people you might not even have met ever, then you don't feel motivated, you don't feel ownership, you are not very motivated to fight for your system or uh, to innovate and try to make the system better. So how can we make a system better? The answer lies in our brains that are wired to serve direct. We don't want to be told what to do because we want to be in control. That's why autonomy in the optimal merge with distributed responsibility are crucial to building self-organized teams. 
people. I mean, there's no question that in, in any any business, any society, there's got to be somebody that's at the top calling the shots uh, roughly about which direction we go. Uh, but, uh, but once you kind of have defined the strategy, then you're very well advised to distribute responsibility for it to a very large extent. Because again, uh, we, we know also from societies where you had the deep centralization, you know, the five-year plans in the Soviet Union where you try to predict everything under the sun and make rules for it. It simply didn't work. People went starving and, and, and uh, they ran out of everything. Making smarter and faster decisions requires enabling those who are closer to the information, not to the source of power. But getting there is not easy, for centralization quite often prevents societies from getting along with the necessary changes. Centralization makes it much harder for the society to adapt to change. Change coming from the outside or from the inside. So um, you can say that the society, society that is highly centralized might look or appear magnificent, but in fact it is very fragile. And you have seen many times in history that sophisticated civilizations collapsed because they have become completely inflexible. Great civilizations are not murdered. Instead, they take their own lives. So what can the rise and fall of historic civilizations tell us about our own? What are the forces that precipitate or delay a collapse? Furthermore, do we see similar patterns today? There have been many cases in history where creative people or nations like Athens, Rome, the British Empire and others were stopped in their tracks. How does that generally happen? Does every story have its own unique explanation? Or are there some general patterns that are frequently repeated? Stay tuned with us and follow the story of decentralization in chapter 2.